in the second to last session, or second to last talk, is none other than this bald head. I mean, this guy here Ed. named Tom Naughton. Who loves Tom in here? Yeah. Did this little film nobody's ever seen before called Fathead. And he's working on a brand new project. He's been working on it for a few years now, but he's working hey. on a brand new project that's all about children. And so he wants to give you a sneak peek as to what he's got so far. And uh, hopefully by the next cruise, yes. it'll be completed. So. Yes. Without further delay, Tom Naughton. I apologize for sitting. I have sections of the book to read. I've got a slideshow. I've got the microphone. And I only have two hands, so this is what I look like. Now you can look up there. You guys good? Yep. Yep. All right, well, when I left last year's cruise, I had promised myself I was going to show up this year with the book all done and probably have part of the film version to show you guys. And then real life set in with things like my job, our farm, kids, and of course, strange people showing up out of nowhere trying to beat me at my own game. <laughs> so that's part of my excuse. Now, here's the rest of it. I actually got pretty far into the book and then I kind of sat back, looked at everything I had so far, and I didn't like it. So, by show of hands, how many people were here last year? I gave a speech that I said was going to be a chapter from the book. Okay. That chapter was called Getting Fat Isn't About Character, It's About Chemistry. You may remember we looked at the piggy bank theory. You know, the idea it's just too many calories like putting dollars in the bank. So if you make smaller deposits or make bigger withdrawals by exercising, bingo, you withdraw calories, you lose weight. And to explain why the piggy bank theory doesn't work, I introduced this character. You remember this? The bank manager application. <laughs> and we explained that the bank manager application receives messages from the rest of your body and then runs code that makes you fatter or thinner depending on the message. Well, I actually thought that explanation worked pretty well. But earlier in the book, I was talking about fast versus slow metabolism. I was doing that by using a house, you know, where you turn the energy bill up or down. Later in the book, I was trying to explain that your body can burn glucose or fat and why it chooses one instead of the other. I came up with this analogy of a race car with two different fuel tanks. At that point, I stopped and looked at everything I had. I said, I've got a house, I've got a bank manager application, I've got a race car. I've got an entire chapter on the history of human diets. This stuff all works individually, but when I look at it all together, I went, bleh. So, I was sitting there tossing pages around, calling myself names, wondering how the heck I could fix all this and make it work, and then the answer came to me. I should ask my wife if she has any ideas. <laughs> So Sharif and she did, and we tossed some ideas back and forth, and one idea led to another, and then bingo, we finally came up with it, one analogy we can use throughout this entire book to explain all these topics to kids. So I had to go back and rewrite everything I had done so far, and then go on and finish the book, and this awesome lady has been now drawing like crazy to try to do all the illustrations and lay out all the pages in Adobe InDesign. She's been working really, really hard, and we're getting there but the book's not done. So what I wanna to do today is just give you a preview of the book by reading a few key sections and then kind of describing what it's about and show you some of Shariva's designs, cartoons, page layouts, okay? Okay, so that's the book's cover so far. And I will read the introduction, which goes like this. You probably remember someone like me from grade school. I was what the other kids called a brain. But that was almost 50 years ago, and I'm told kids nowadays wouldn't insult me like that. Today they'd call me a nerd, a dork, or possibly a dweeb. Anyway, you know the type. I was usually the smartest kid in class, and I was lousy at sports. How lousy? Well, here's one of my not-so-fond memories from gym class. We were running a relay race where each guy on the team had to dribble a basketball down court, make a layup, then dribble back and hand off to the next guy. I was the last guy on our team, and when I got the ball, we were in the lead. I bounced the ball down the court, tossed it toward the basket, and missed. By a lot. I tried again and missed, and missed again, and again. Mostly because my weak little arms couldn't fling the ball high enough. The other team had already won, but the gym teacher growled, you're not quitting until you make that basket. So I leaned back and hurled the ball as hard as I could. It bounced off the rim, smacked me in the face, and knocked me on my butt. 
At that point, the gym teacher decided I could quit after all. <laughs> Around age 13, something happened to my skinny body I didn't think was possible. I started getting fat, but I didn't become one of those big, strong, fat guys. Nope. I had skinny arms and legs, a fat belly, and most embarrassing of all, boy boobs. <laughs> I wasn't fast even when I was skinny, but getting fat gave me the speed of a turtle. When I was in seventh grade, yet another gym teacher had us run a relay race. Once again, I was the last man on our team, and we were leading when it was my turn to run. When the last guy on the other team took off, he didn't bother trying to outrun me. Instead, he skipped to the finish line. Do you have any idea how embarrassing it is to lose a race to a guy who's skipping? Meanwhile, I was running as fast as I could, and my boy boobs were slapping me so hard it was like jogging with the Three Stooges. <laughs> That's when I came to appreciate the kindness and compassion that's so common among adolescent boys. And so, like millions of fat people before me, I came up with a plan. I'll just starve myself until I'm as skinny as they are. Then they can't make fun of me for being fat. I went on my first diet when I was 14. I counted every calorie and only ate 1,500 per day. The results were unbelievable. I spent weeks feeling hungry, cranky, and tired without shrinking my belly enough to notice. So once again, once again, I did what millions of other fat people have done. I gave up. But like millions of other fat people, I kept trying. Over the decades, I went on all kinds of low-fat, low-calorie diets, but I couldn't seem to shrink my belly. Or I'd lose a little weight and gain it back. As an adult, I spent hundreds of hours jogging and walking on a treadmill, and I still didn't shrink my belly. And every time I failed to lose weight, I knew exactly who to blame. Me. I realize now I didn't fail. The diets failed, the exercise programs failed, they failed because they're based on beliefs about weight loss that simply aren't true. I finally figured that out when I made a documentary called Fathead. I read a ton of research while making Fathead, and when I put what I learned into action, I finally lost the weight and kept it off. And it wasn't just the extra fat that went away. I also waved goodbye to a bunch of annoying health problems. So in my 50s, I finally had something like the body I wanted to have in high school. Well, okay, when I was in high school, I wanted to look like this. But this is pretty good, considering I spent most of my life as a fat guy. After Fathead was released, hundreds of people sent me emails telling me how happy they were to finally lose weight. Sometimes they included before and after pictures. Lots of people who emailed me said pretty much the same thing. I'm glad I finally lost the weight and got healthy, but man, I wish I'd known this stuff when I was a kid. My whole life could have been different. Same goes for me. If I'd known then what I know now, my whole life could have been different too. So that's what you'll learn from this book. Important stuff about diet and health I wish I knew when I was your age. There's some before and after pictures people have sent me. So chapter one is called Getting Fat Isn't About Character. It is almost exactly like the first part of the speech I gave last year, so I'm not gonna read any of it again. We introduce the piggy bank theory. We give several examples from real life to show why it doesn't work. So moving on, chapter two is called Getting Fat Is About Chemistry. And I'm gonna pick it up here partway through the chapter and just read you some. If you're like most kids these days, you already have some favorite software applications, only you probably call them apps. My daughters love their apps, and I have to admit, some of them are pretty cool. But even the coolest apps can only do what they've been programmed to do, not what you want them to do. When I'm playing Frisbee golf on our Wii machine, I can't just decide I'm going to reach the green on the 17th hole with one throw. That's how I want the app to work, and in my opinion, that's how it should work. But an app doesn't know or care how we want it to work. When you click a mouse, type on a keyboard, touch a screen, or work a remote, you send the app a message, otherwise known as a command. The app responds to the message by following the instructions that are written into its code every single time. That's how all apps work. To create apps for tablets and computers, software programmers like me write code in a language like C or Java. Your body is like a big collection of biological apps, but these apps were programmed by nature and the code is written in chemistry. 
Everything about you, from the color of your eyes, to the sound of your voice, to the size of your belly, is the result of instructions that are written into your chemical code. So to understand why we get fat and the other topics in this book, let's forget about piggy banks and the stupidly simple math of calories in versus calories out. Nothing in the human body is simple. Instead, I want you to think of your body as a biological starship, one that's way cooler than the Enterprise, the Millennium Falcon, or any other starship you've seen in the movies. We'll call our starship the Nautilus. The Nautilus is the amazing vehicle that carries you through the universe as you explore new worlds, save friendly creatures from the forces of evil, and occasionally get into trouble with your parents. You're in the captain's chair so you can operate many of the controls. You can decide where the Nautilus will go and what missions it will try to accomplish. That's the good news. Now here's the not so good news. You can't change how the Nautilus works. It's not like a modern aircraft that humans designed and can redesign when they need to. The Nautilus was designed and programmed by nature at the dawn of time and it's at least a thousand times more complicated than anything built by NASA. The best we can do is try to understand how it works. Mr. Spot, the ship's science officer, has been studying the Nautilus for decades. So has Dr. Fishbones, the ship's doctor. In spite of all their, their research, there's a lot they still don't know. But lucky for us, there's plenty they do know. And then Shreva has these characters come in with you know big bubbles when they're talking. Mr. Spot jumps in to say, that's correct, Captain. We know, for example, that the Nautilus depends almost entirely on a supercomputer we call the brain. We know this computer communicates with the rest of the ship through a network called the nervous system. We also know that most of the work inside the ship is done automatically by the crew. These crew members are actually biological software applications, or what your Earth children call apps. They're part of an integrated system, which means they send messages to each other and respond accordingly. And then Dr. Fishbone jumps in to say, thanks for the dry scientific explanation, Spot. I think what's important to understand, Captain, is that without these crew members working together, life aboard the Nautilus wouldn't be possible. Our crew is fantastic, amazing, stupendous. They're all that and a side of moonbeams, as your Earth children might say. Well, I'm pretty sure my Earth children wouldn't say that, but Dr. Fishbones is right about this. Your body's biological apps are fantastic. No human programmer could create apps as brilliant as the ones that keep the Nautilus flying, but they're still apps, which means when they receive a message, all they can do is follow the instructions written into their code. When you become a wizard with your favorite app, it means you've learned to send the right message at the right time. It's the same with the Nautilus. The only way to improve your starship's performance is to change the messages you send to the crew. And guess what? Everything you eat sends a chemical message. You have to eat, of course. As the Nautilus explores the universe, it burns a lot of fuel. It also requires daily rebuilding and repairs, which means it constantly needs new building materials. Fuels and building materials are both delivered through a single hatch, so we'll refer to both of them by the same word, FUD. As the captain, you can choose what kind of FUD goes through the hatch. That's the good news. But once again, here's the not so good news. You can't decide what the Nautilus will do with the FUD. Those decisions are made by the ship's chief engineer, an absolutely amazing app we'll call Marty Metabolism, or just Marty for short. Marty is probably the most important member of the entire crew. We'll let Dr. Fishbones explain why. Fishbones jumps in to say, Marty's responsibilities are enormous. He's in charge of all the building and repair projects. He keeps the engines running. He controls the heating system. He monitors and manages the fuel supply. And he has to do all those jobs every at the same time, every hour of every day. We couldn't do anything without him. He's amazing. So then we have this section explaining that it's Marty who decides when the ship is allowed to burn more energy, when it needs to burn less energy, the fast meta metabolism, slow metabolism, and I'll pick up again here. Your job as captain would certainly be easier if you could just send orders directly to Marty like this. And I don't know if you can see it back there in the back, but he's saying, Marty, I want to lose 10 pounds before summer. Crank up all the systems to use more energy and burn extra fat. Marty says, I captain. Unfortunately, that's not how the Nautilus was programmed. As an app, Marty doesn't know or care how you want him to do his job. 
He simply reacts to what's happening inside the ship and responds to messages from the crew. The brain and the crew send alerts and commands to each other through chemical messengers called hormones. When Marty receives a message from the rest of the ship, it's often a command such as get taller or build bigger muscles or store more fat. To follow those commands, Marty has to adjust how much FUD the ship burns for energy, how much it stores as fat, and how much it converts into building materials. In other words, he has to adjust the difference between calories in and calories out. So then the rest of this chapter is very much like what I talked about last year, only it's not the bank manager making these decisions, it's Marty. And if Marty is receiving the message that says get fatter, then you are going to get fatter unless you starve yourself. Starving yourself is a bad idea because, and we're going to show all this with cartoons, according to Marty, starving yourself creates a fuel emergency. So he does what he's always been programmed to do. He responds by slowing down your metabolism so the Nautilus burns less, less fuel, releasing chemicals that make you as the captain feel tired and depressed so you don't waste fuel flying around, He'll break down your muscles and burn some of the muscle tissue for fuel. Or, and, he'll reprogram the fuel system to make storing fat even easier than before to survive the next emergency. And then after some other bits, we close with, the good news is that you can lose the extra weight. I've done it despite spending most of my life as a fat guy and so have millions of other people. But to burn away the fat and keep it off, you have to work with the code written into your ship's chemistry, not against it. You have to stop firing up the Get Fatter program. You have to stop triggering the Get Hungry program when you shouldn't be hungry, and you absolutely positively have to avoid triggering a starvation emergency. Every time you eat, you send messages to the crew of the Nautilus. What you eat and don't eat also determines the messages Marty sends back to you. If you're not happy with your starship, the only way to improve it is to change the messages that trigger the ship's code. It isn't about character, it's about chemistry. So let's talk about food and why different foods trigger different programs inside the Nautilus. So then we move on to chapter three, which is called Hunger is a Message from the Crew. In this chapter, we explain that the Nautilus needs daily building and repairs to stay healthy, so Marty needs a constant supply of quality building materials, and the materials he needs are protein, quality fats, vitamins and minerals. We show how the crew of the Nautilus uses each of these to keep the ship healthy. And then we explain that if you deliver a big load of FUD through the hatch, but you don't give Marty the materials he actually needs, he's going to do what he's been programmed to do which is fire up the Get Hungry program to, de to demand another shipment of FUD. And we close with, if you eat too much because your body's running the Get Hungry program too often, it probably means Marty isn't getting what he needs. But according to the piggy bank theory, the cure is to simply eat less, which means giving Marty even less of what he needs. How do you think he and the other crew members react if that happens? I'm sure you can guess. They'll send out distress signals like crazy. Marty will run the Get Hungry program nonstop. You'd have to be superhuman to resist, and if you did, it would be a bad decision. You might lose a little weight, but the Nautilus would start breaking down and you'd end up feeling miserable. So I'll say it again, you don't lose weight and keep it off by going hungry. You lose weight by changing why you're hungry in the first place. When your meals include enough protein, micronutrients, and quality fats, Marty stops running the Get Hungry program. Then you eat less without even thinking about it. So then we move on to chapter four, how the fuel system works. I'll read a brief bit here. As chief engineer, Marty has many important jobs, but controlling the mix of fuels the ship burns might be the most important. To protect the brain, he can't let blood sugar go too low. To protect the rest of the ship, he can't let blood sugar go too high. So Marty is constantly monitoring the fuel supply and deciding whether to burn sugar and store fat, or burn fat and store sugar, or burn, or burn and store some of each. Marty's ability to handle this job is a fine example of how brilliantly the Nautilus was programmed, so let's take a look at how he does it. So then we're gonna show graphically this whole thing where some FUD comes down the hatch. We show a crew member named Chef Chop Chop who has to take, and this is real food, has to rip open all the fibers and tear open the cells and slice things into little bits of amino acids and glucose. 
and then uh, that's so they can squeeze through those security filters once the little bits of food enter the bloodstream. Marty takes over and then we're going to have a bunch of graphics of Marty at his control panel watching things happen on the monitors and reacting to what happens when blood sugar goes up. He has to bring it down by running the Get Fatter program to store fat so the sugar gets burned first. And of course he does that by releasing insulin. Then his blood sugar drops, Marty needs to make sure there's enough glucose for the brain. So he lowers the insulin and allows the fat to come out of the cells. So the, swip, uh, the ship switches to burning fat. Then we finish with, this is how the Nautilus was designed to work. Marty runs the Get Hungry program just often enough to make sure you deliver the fuel and building materials he needs. After a meal, he runs the Get Fatter program for a short time to store some fat. Then he shuts off the Get Fatter program to release the fat. The fat cells grow large enough to serve their purpose in the system, but not so large that they weigh down the ship. Like I said, it's a fine example of brilliant programming. But as a programmer, I know apps are written to fit their environment. If the environment changes, even the most brilliant app can produce bad results. Here's an example. In the late 1990s, corporations had to spend billions of dollars to reprogram software that stored dates like this. We know the date's January 15, sorry for the Europeans. We know the date is January 15, but what's the year? Well, the old software was programmed when the year was always 19-something. That was the environment, so the year would be 1918. And for several decades, that wasn't a problem. But when the year 2000 came around, the environment changed. Now the same software would produce bad results. If you were born in 2001 and someone entered your birthday as 011501, the software would assume you were already 100 years old. Imagine if that software also decided where you should live and what clothes you should wear. We'd have toddlers living in nursing homes wearing ugly golf shorts. <laughs> we have a similar problem today with the Nautilus. The app that controls the fuel system worked perfectly for 99% of human history. That's because the app was programmed for an environment of real foods. But since then, our food supply has changed so drastically, it's as if the Nautilus traveled to a completely different planet. And then another, and another, and another. That's when the Nautilus began to break down far more often than it should. And that is the idea we then carry through all the rest of the chapters in the book. Almost everything that goes wrong with the Nautilus today is the result of delivering the wrong kind of FUD through the hatch, because this FUD is not what the ship was designed and programmed to handle. So I'm going to just breeze through several more chapters. Uh, chapter five is called Today's Healthy Diet is Not Your Natural Diet. In this chapter, we explain that the Nautilus was designed and programmed for what we call the planet of real foods, which is where humans live for 99% of their existence. <coughs> then around 10,000 years ago, we started migrating to the planet of FUD farms, which is when the Nautilus first began to break down. Then about 150 years ago, we migrated to the planet of industrial FUD. This is when we began eating a lot of processed sugars and gr grains, which send the wrong messages to the crew. And then to quote directly from the book, <coughs> then came the biggest mistake of all, a mass migration to the planet of the preposterous pyramid. <laughs> On this crazy planet, we were told that the foods humans had been eating forever are bad for us. We were told that to be healthy, we need to eat grains and industrial oils that no humans ever ate when the Nautilus was designed and programmed. It makes absolutely no sense, and yet we believed it. So we started eating more food-like products that only exist because of modern industry. As a result, the brilliant programming that made the Nautilus such a fabulous ship is no longer operating in the environment it was designed to handle. Now our code is responding to chemical messages from FUD we were never meant to eat. Those messages are causing our starships to run the Get Hungry and Get Fatter programs too often and for too long. So if the planet of the preposterous pyramid is such a lousy place, how did we end up here? which leads to chapter six, how bad science caused a mass migration to the wrong planet. We quickly describe how a scientist named Ansel Keys started the scientific version of an intergalactic war, and how he should have lost that war, but was saved by an emperor so powerful the good scientists couldn't defeat it, namely the US government and the USDA. 
And we finish with, now that you know how we got here, let's look at why you need to leave this crazy planet. Takes us to chapter seven, how the wrong FUD sends the wrong message. In this chapter, we explain how the industrial foods and all these things, the sugars and processed carbohydrates, send the wrong messages, largely because this FUD comes down the hatch, Chef Chop Chop's supposed to jump in there and rip open those fibers and cells, and they're not there. So Chop Chop just slices up all the glucose, dumps it right into the bloodstream, Marty's monitors start going crazy, and then Mar Marty has to do what he's programmed to do, which is react by running the Get Fatter program. Like that, yes. Okay, moving on to chapter eight is called How Bad FUD Damages the Fuel System. We describe how processed carbohydrates and industrial oils produce inflammation, which causes the ship's cells to become insulin resistant, insulin resistant, and then we explain why insulin resistance forces Marty to run the Get Fatter program all the time to prevent damage to the ship. That's that. Chapter nine, bad food makes boy boobs. <laughs> We explain how industrial FUD causes Marty to store fat in your liver, and then that fat changes testosterone into estrogen. The estrogen tells Marty's building crews that as you grow, they need to use uh, some of the blueprints for a female ship. Chapter 10, those healthy whole grains are not health food. We describe several ways how modern wheat screws up uh, and damages the structures of the Nautilus, describing, for example, how gliadin breaks through those security filters we saw earlier, then all those foreign particles fall into the bloodstream, and then the ship's security officer, a guy named Sergeant Shockey, has to go on the attack, and it's the molecular mimicry that they mentioned before. He ends up accidentally attacking the Nautilus itself and causing autoimmune diseases. Chapter 11 is called Food Sets the Mood. We describe how industrial oils um, caused and uh, how industrial oils are bad for the brain, which needs real fat. And we describe how these crazy up and down blood sugar cy cycles also mess with the supercomputer called the brain. Chapter 12, good sleep is almost as important as good food. We explain how the Nautilus needs daily rebuilding and repairs, but Marty's crews can only do some of those repairs when the ship is powered down. If the ship is not powered down long enough to be repaired, it starts to break down. Chapter 13, to be healthy, you need to feed trillions of your closest friends. In this chapter, we learn that what scientists long believed was just the ship's garbage chute is actually home to trillions of crew members who send messages directly to Marty and the brain. If you wanna be healthy, you need the right crew members living down there, which means you have to feed them the right kind of food. Chapter 14 is called My Whole Life Could Have Been Different. This is after we've taught them all this stuff and we explain, okay, now that you understand how this works, let's look at the diet I had as a kid. And now look at how those messages, the messages sent by that food caused me, uh, caused me to become fatter, weaker, and far less energetic than I should have been. And then I move on to say, okay, let's look at the diet I live on now. Let's look at how those, message, how those foods send the right messages, which is why I'm leaner, stronger, more energetic than I was then. And I finish that chapter with this. I'm grateful that I finally figured it out as I approached age 50. As the saying goes, better late than never. But you don't have to make that choice. For you, the choice is sooner rather than later. You just have to decide it's time to steer your ship back towards the planet of real foods. And finally, chapter 15, the last chapter is called, It's Perfectly Good to Be Good Instead of Perfect. In this chapter, we explain that to lose weight and be healthy, you do not have to switch to a perfectly pure diet that you'll never stick to. And no, you don't have to buy all your vegetables from a barefoot hippie farmer who never uses <laughs> pesticides and only takes a bath on Saturday night. <laughs> you just need to live on a good diet most of the time. A good diet starts with three simple rules. Don't eat refined sugar. Don't eat refined grains. Don't eat industrial vegetable oils. And then to keep improving the health of the Nautilus, you need to spend as much time as possible living on the planet of real foods. Those are the foods the Nautilus was designed and programmed to handle. And then we close the book with this because when I was a fat kid, I wish someone had said this to me. If you're struggling with your weight, I want you to know I've been where you are. 
I felt the emotional sting of the insults from the leaner, stronger guys. I felt my face turn red when I was picked last for team sports. I spent years feeling ashamed of my body. That shame was a waste, a complete and utter waste. It didn't solve anything. It didn't make me better at anything. You cannot criticize yourself into becoming a healthier and happier person. If you're still in school, I'm old enough to be your father or perhaps old enough to be your grandfather. So I hope you'll take some advice from a guy who's been on this planet a lot longer than you have. There are things that truly matter in life. The shape of your body isn't one of them. What matters are the people you love, the friends you make, the things you learn, and the talents you discover and nurture. And trust me, you probably won't discover your true talents until you're older. My wife, who illustrated this book, began studying art in her late 20s. I didn't try stand-up comedy until I was 30, and then I performed in comedy clubs for the next 10 years. I didn't become a software programmer until I was nearly 40, and I was almost 50 when I wrote and produced my first film, Fathead. When you discover your true talents, they'll lead, they'll lead you to the most exciting and useful missions for your version of the Nautilus. But you can only be the pilot of your own ship. So don't waste your time and mental energy comparing yourself to people who were born to look awesome. Don't waste your life wishing you had their version of the Nautilus instead of yours. Don't waste years thinking that if you exercise enough or starve yourself enough, you'll have a perfect body and then you'll be happy. It's perfectly good to be good instead of perfect. So focus on being healthy and then get on with what truly matters in life. That will make you happy. I didn't write this book to teach you how to look like a model or a professional athlete. I wrote this book because I know life can be a long and wonderful journey. But to enjoy it fully, you need to make that journey in a good ship. Not a perfect ship, not the sleekest or strongest or most beautiful ship, but a good ship. A good ship is a healthy ship. So take good care of the Nautilus, my young friend, and the Nautilus will take good care of you. Enjoy the ride.